All right, hello everyone. Welcome to our lesson for January 11th, 2018. Today we're going to talk about Italian and German unification. So I mentioned earlier this week that we would be focusing on some different countries. So um, today we're going to learn about how Italy became a united country and also how Germany uh, became a united country. So our objectives and standards today to compare the unification of Italy to the unification of Germany and to analyze leadership in the unification of Italy and the unification of Germany. And take a moment there to read over the standards if you would. And our desired result, how were the unification of Italy and the unification of Germany successful in using nationalism? So remember, nationalism is being devoted to your country, your country's values, your country's beliefs. Um, so how were those things uh, an important factor or important player in how these two countries were uh, created. Vocabulary for today, we have junkers, uh, members of Prussia's wealthy land-owning class that were strongly conservative. Uh, Realpolitik is a German term that means the politics of reality. Uh, basically means tough power politics with no room for your idealism. And then Kaiser, um, not the role, <laughs> but Kaiser is the term for emperor in German. So let's talk about Italy first. Um, many people in Italy were tired of living under foreign leaders uh, in the early to mid-1800s uh, in Europe. Um, and they began to look towards uh, a kingdom. Uh, it, it, Italy had been broken up into certain kingdoms and like regions uh, prior before it was a whole country. So many people began to look to the northern kingdom of Piedmont Sardinia, which uh, had very strong leadership um, and things like that. And Piedmont Sardinia also had adopted a very liberal constitution in 1848. So people wanted to follow that. Um, King Victor Emmanuel II, he was the leader of this region, and he is going to name that gentleman right there, that picture you see. His name is Camillo di Cavour, uh, and he was the prime minister of the Piedmont Sardinia kingdom at the time. Um, he was an excellent politician uh, who knew how to gain control, how to use politics, how to use government, how to uh, gain alliances, um, and he is going to be a, an important factor in uniting uh, this Italian country. So pushing out the Austrians, Cavour knew that the problem in Northern Italy was the Austrians. Remember, Italy had been under control of many different foreign powers, one of them being the Austrians. Uh, so he knew that the power struggle here was with the Austrians. Now he's going to unite with France's emperor Napoleon III. Remember, we talked about him uh, a couple of days ago. Uh, so he's going to unite with uh, France's emperor Napoleon III. And together, they're going to push the Austrians out of Italy. So then, with that said, after they push out most of the Austrians, uh, Sardinia will control most of northern Italy. Now, in the southern part of Italy, we have another gentleman. Um, Cavour, the prime minister in the northern part of Italy, um, he's also supporting secretly some nationalist rebels in southern Italy. Now, their leader is going to be that gentleman right there. His name is Giuseppe Garibaldi. Um, he and his followers always wore a bright red shirt into battle, so they were known as the Red Shirts. So they're fighting also against foreign powers as well. In May of 1860, Garibaldi and his followers are going to capture Sicily. They then are going to march north, and they agree to unite with the uh, northern forces, um, or the southern forces within the northern kingdom of Piedmont Sardinia. And he is going to march and fight to win much of control of southern Italy. So we have Cavour in the north, and we have Garibaldi in the south, and both of these gentlemen are going to unite. So Cavour arranged for Garibaldi to meet uh, King Victor, uh, King Victory, King Victor, my apologies, King Victor Emmanuel II uh, to meet. And after they meet, Gar Garibaldi agrees that, you know, these two sides should unite. He'll step aside as leader of southern Italy, and he will allow Victor Emmanuel II to be the king of all of Italy. The only exception to this is, is that Vatican City, um, which is still true today, Vatican City is its own independent kind of entity, its own independent country um, that remains in control of the Pope. So, again, this is how Italy forms, this is how Italy unites. Um... So this will be the creation of what we commonly refer to as Italy today. 
Now in Germany, uh, we also have a very kind of kind of similar thing that goes on. Um, so German unification begins. In 1815, there was a loose confederation of German states that formed what was known as the German Confederation. Now Austria dominated this confederation, uh, but Prussia wants to help the German states. They want to help form a German kind of country, a German nation. Um, the reason for this being is that Prussia mainly has a German population, um, and they're also looking to kind of expand their power as well. Because Prussia had a superior army by 1848 in Europe. Also in 1848, there was going to be rioters in Berlin, Germany, that are going to force a call for a constitution, um, and unification of Germany will soon begin after that. So Bismarck comes to power, this gentleman right here on the left-hand side of your screen. Uh, so number one here, 1861, William I, I'm sorry, Wilhelm uh, I, uh, he comes to the throne in Prussia. Okay, so remember, we're not really talking about Prussia is playing a role in how Germany forms, okay? So Wilhelm II, he's the king of uh, Prussia. Um, and when he asked the parliament in Prussia for money for the military, they refused. Wilhelm II sees this as a threat to his power. So he then goes to what we call the Junkers. Now the Junkers, again, were conservative members of Prussia's wealthy landing class. Uh, they agree that Wilhelm I's power is being, you know, kind of questioned and, you know, doesn't really have the authority. You know, people are saying he doesn't have the authority to do what he wants. So Wilhelm II will then choose, like we said, that gentleman there with the cool looking helmet and the fantastic mustache, I guess you could say. Uh, he chooses a, a junker who was also a strong leader, uh, Otto von Bismarck, and he chooses him to then be prime minister of Prussia. Bismarck believed in something like we said called real politik or the politics of reality. So he doesn't want to get into idealism. He just wants to focus on the real facts, just kind of focus on what's really going on, what we need to do and how we're going to get it done. He doesn't want to talk about you know, what we could maybe do or how we could possibly get it done. He wants to just get things done. So he uses tough power politics to achieve this. Um, he told Parliament that he did not have to obey them and that even if they would not approve a budget for him to operate with or to use to, you know, do what he needed to do, he just basically says, ah, that's fine. I don't need a budget. I'll just, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll do what I need to do without your support. So we kind of a tough guy but also uh, a very important figure, especially in helping to unite Germany. So again, remember, Prussia is playing a leading role in this. So war is going to unite Germany. Bismarck is going to help the German territory expand through a series of wars. One of these was a war with Denmark, which built up support for uh, Bismarck and also gained some territory. The Seven Weeks War was with Austria, and it established northern control of German states, so now Germany is starting to form in the northern part of it. And then we also have the Franco-Prussian War, which finally established a united Germany in the south. So now we have a complete Germany. We have a northern Germany and a southern Germany, basically, um, after they defeated the French. So now we begin to see Germany form. So Germany will be created uh, in 1871. Wilhelm I will be crowned Kaiser um, or Emperor of Germany. That's his picture there. And we're going to see some power shifts. Remember, in 1815, the Congress of Vienna had established five great powers in Europe. They were, again, Great Britain, France, Austria, Russia, and Prussia. Remember, they, the whole idea of the Congress of Vienna was to keep a balance of power, a balance of, um, you know, power and things like that. So that way, uh, Europe would not wind up in war again as it did under Napoleon. So many of these countries were equal in strength. But we're going to see here that there's going to be some power shifts in Europe um, in the mid-1800s. Prussia, for one, is going to grow in strength as it united with uh, Germany. We're going to see that Great Britain and Germany will also become probably the most powerful in Europe uh, by 1871. They will be the two leading powers in, in Europe at this time. 
Uh, as in terms of those who were kind of a little bit behind, we'll say Russia and Austria uh, were kind of in the back of the pack, kind of, um, in terms of power. And then in the middle, we see that France. We see France is there in the middle. Uh, they were struggling with some things as well. Again, talked about the revolutions and things going on in France in the middle of the 1800s. Um, so there's some struggle there for France, but they're kind of in the middle of the pack. But again, the important part to remember here is that there's going to be that whole idea that the Congress of Vienna had set up this balance of power. Uh, it's going to begin to break down in Europe. Um, there's not going to be equal power anymore. We'll begin to see countries have different power, and those power uh, realms are going to shift um, in the next couple of years as well. All right, so I appreciate you uh, tuning in. Try your best on the questions that follow, and let me know if you have any questions. Thanks a lot, guys.